Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Proverbs. The Old Testament book of Proverbs and Proverbs in chapter number 6. Proverbs and chapter number 6. We're continuing with our little mini-series that we're hitting off and on throughout this year of going through the lessons in wisdom, the lessons found within the book of Proverbs. We now find our way to the book of Proverbs in chapter number six, and we deal with a very heavy, important subject that the Bible discusses over and over and over. We find it mentioned in the book of Proverbs in chapter number six. The book of Proverbs chapter six, and if you wouldn't mind noticing with me starting at verse number 24. Proverbs chapter six And in verse number 24, the word of God says this, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold, and he shall give all the substance of his house. But whosoever committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. For jealousy is the rage of a man, and he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he <coughs> rest content, though he givest many gifts. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a very powerful phrase in the book of Proverbs chapter 6? Proverbs chapter 6, and notice with me verse 32, where it says, whosoever committeth adultery. Whosoever committeth adultery. And with this, we want to hit from Proverbs chapter 6, the sin of adultery. The sin of adultery. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come up to you, we thank you for the wisdom that you give us through your word. Lord, we understand that there Out of all the subjects in the word of God, this is one of the things that we deal with practically that is the most uncomfortable. We could deal with other sins and we could get by, but this one is an uncomfortable sin. Just talking about it just gives everyone an ill ease. And that's because it is an awful, wretched sin, a sin against you. I'm asking, Lord, that you would give us much wisdom and much discernment as we examine this passage, that you would help us, that, Lord, that you would do preventative maintenance in the minds and the hearts of people are here, and, Lord, that you would be a restorer of those who maybe have fallen. Lord, I'm asking that you would just do a work, a wonderful work, a work of victory in the hearts and minds of people tonight. Thank you, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to Proverbs chapter 6, we notice that this is the third warning Solomon has given so far in the book of Proverbs dealing with the subject of immorality. Three different times, or three times including this one, Solomon has set his son down and he has 
talk to him about fleeing fornication, fleeing from the whorish woman, from the strange woman, to guard himself and to guard his heart. Now, of course, we know as a side, we wish Solomon would have followed this advice. But at this time, he's right with the Lord. At this time, he's getting direction from the Lord. At this time, he has the wisdom that comes from God. And he gives a very profound warning listed inside of the word of God, one that we have to pay attention to ourselves. And so if you don't mind, the first thing I want to hit in this passage is the principle of the strange woman. The principle of the strange woman. Now we've defined this word strange before in an earlier message, but once again, we will redefine this word. And this is going to be a very important word through this passage. The word strange carries the idea of something that does not belong to you. It doesn't carry the idea that the person's deformed or strange looking or has peculiar ways or little idiosyncrasies. The principle of strange flesh is something that doesn't belong to you, but you have desire to have it. And once again, Solomon is warning about this principle of strange flesh. The principle grows to I want to touch something that I've never tried before. It includes someone or wanting someone or something because I'm not supposed to have it. And if we come to this idea of adultery, we know that there is a sexual thrill that comes from the flesh of desiring to have something that's not yours to have in the first place. And there is a dangerous principle here dealing with the strange woman, the woman that does not belong to you. And God warns very fervently, very clearly, very heatedly in this passage not to lust, not to go after, flee from the strange woman. Notice with me as we see this in verse number 24. We see that there's some principles here about the strange woman. Notice here the strange woman's tongue. The strange woman's tongue. Verse 24. To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Notice the Bible identifies the strange woman as evil. This word evil here denotes breaking up of all that is good. And this is what this woman is going to do. Is she's going to end up breaking up All that was good inside of a marriage, inside of a person's life. It carries with it the idea of moral depravity and corruption. This word evil, moral depravity and corruption. And so it puts attention on her tongue, on her mouth, on the words that come out. Her speech is beguiling. She is full of flattery. Sometimes people may use this, she's a flirt. That she says something just kind of slyly. She says something just kind of off color, something suggestive, something teasingly. And it's like a honey trap. She's bringing this on. We know that there are some ladies who are horrible flirts. And whereas they may not think anything of it, they think it's just part of their makeup. It attracts men. This flattery, this flirting, this idea that this man might be able to have something that wasn't originally his. Could it be that she is opened up? Should, could she be there with the possibility? Is there something there to it? We have to. There was a warning to watch her lips, her beguiling things, that she knows what to say to weaken the resolve of the man. That as she just says nice things to him, as she begins to do suggestive things, not outright, not clear, but just off just a little bit, just suggestive, just enough to fill in the blanks. Enough of that starts weakening the resolves and he gets to the place where Maybe perhaps I can get away with this. Maybe perhaps this is for me. Maybe perhaps she desires me. Maybe perhaps I can get away with this. The lips of a strange woman. 
the longer that a man listens to her speak, the more likely he is to be hooked by her speech. The Bible says with this principle of the strange woman, that of the strange woman's lips, the things that are coming out. By the way, if we (laughs) not only warning the men, that men, when you start hearing a lady, don't engage in it. It says to keep from the evil woman, from the flattery of the strange tongue. There's an idea to flee, to go away from that. Don't engage in that. Notice that it is dangerous. You said, but I'm strong enough. You are not strong enough. Anyone is capable of anything at any time. And these words will soften the resolve of anyone. And it takes one moment in the flesh to give in. The principle here is stay away from it in the first place. Don't engage. Don't stay away from that. Now on the other side, ladies, guard your tongue. Guard your tongue. Do you know that you can carry yourself in such a way that some men won't even hit on you because you made yourself unavailable just by the way that you speak? That you speak of godly things. You speak of good things. You don't speak of down and dirty things. Things. You don't speak of suggestive things. It, for them, they don't see you sexually in that matter because you don't speak that away. Guard your tongue, ladies. Men, stay away. Stay away. Not only the strange woman's lips, but notice the strange woman's looks. The strange woman's looks, verse 25. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart. Neither let her take thee with her eyelids. This is a type of woman who's learned how to speak to people with her eyes. That she could say a whole lot with her eyes. She knows how to look, how to raise an eyebrow, how to look suggestive, how to engage and get him entranced with her eyes. Here Solomon's giving the warning, stay away, stay away, don't listen to her words. When you see her eyes locking in and she's drawing you in, look away, stay away. Half the attraction of her is in her eyes. She knows how to use them. You could get lost in those eyes and the promises that they declare. Keep away, keep away from her looks. Don't lust after her. The idea of lusting is carrying with this same theme that we've had is desiring something that's not yours to have. Gentlemen, you shouldn't even be that close. You engage in business, you have to engage in business, but then it's done. Stay away, stay away. And then we see the strange woman's lips, the strange woman's looks, then the strange woman's loss. Notice with me as it goes on in verse 26. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. And an adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Notice here, this woman is going to cause loss. First of all, financial loss. How many man has lost everything because he got engaged into the act of adultery? It ruined his marriage, messed up his reputation, ruined his testimony, disqualified him, met him to the place where there, lost his home. All of this fell apart. And he's suffering financial loss, which then brings to this a final loss. And the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Without a doubt, there are some ladies who are purposely looking to wreck homes purposely trying to ruin lives, purposely looking because they think it is fun. And they leave chaos in their wake and they walk away as if there's no consequences for it. The warning, gentlemen, stay away. (laughs) Stay away. Beware of her lips. Beware of her looks. Understand her loss. The principle of the strange woman. But now we start switching subjects to a little bit heavier. As now the flame is turned hot. And God begins to explain here. That how serious the sin of adultery 
truly is. Notice, if you don't mind, a second thing. The burning from adultery. The burning from adultery. Notice with me in verse 27. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes be not burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So is he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife. Whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. When someone is playing around with another man's wife, he is playing with fire. And by the way, this fire is not will if I get burned, it's when I get burned. There are always consequences and these actions bring awful consequences. Now, we understand that God hates all sin without a doubt. But not all sin has the same consequences. Not all sin has the same consequences. The sin of adultery brings awful, lasting, horrible consequences. Awful consequences. Awful consequences. God's the one who designed marriage in the first place. When people attempt to redefine God's definition, whether in theory or in practice, it serves to destroy the home. Remember that the home is the building block to society. Strong homes, strong society. Weak homes, weak society. And so <coughs> with this, we have to work on strengthening the homes. Today, homes are in such a disarray. We're at the place where, where sexualism is just a common place. There was a surveyor who stepped into a restaurant. And there was a lady of, or uh, a group of ladies, 10 ladies, all circled around. The man came and said, you mind if I just ask you a couple questions? They said, sure. He says, we're doing a quick survey of how many ladies have ever committed adultery. Out of the 10 ladies that was there, nine of them raised their hand admitting that they had committed adultery. One of them went home to her husband and explained the situation and said, yeah, the guy came up and he asked us who he did. I want to let you know that I raised my hand, but I did not commit adultery with you. It just, uh, my other friends raised their hand and I didn't want them to look bad upon me. That's the type of society that we live in today is that if people are not engaged in immorality and sexual sins, that the people who are doing right seem off. Because our society is so backwards that it's the idea that the moral fabric has now been destroyed with the redefining of the homes, with the idea of redefining marriage in theory or in practice. I can do whatever I want. It will be fine. My wife and I have an arrangement. All of those other things destroy the fabric. It ruins the homes, which brings destruction upon a society. We now live in a society where there's so many places in an inner city where the, where the kids don't even know their fathers. They don't know who their fathers are. They don't have that male influence to help them in their life. And what happens is that the fabric ruins. Things are destroyed. The idea is is put differently. The thought processes are changed. That when a fabric of a home is destroyed, it destroys societies. And we live in a society that we have ruins everywhere. The home is under attack like never before. It is more of a ministry of each and every local church to do what we can to strengthen the homes that we have, to help repair the breaches, to help repair and to help people and to have the strongest marriages we have because we live in a ruined society. And we have a hard time advancing forward spiritually because we're trying to repair the ruins. 
We're stuck trying to repair the home so we could have a society to function. And it hinders the work of God. It hinders what God is trying to do. It puts so much of a hindrance inside of the way. There are horrible consequences because of this sin. Which now brings us to the last part where we're going to spend the most time. The grief from adultery. The grief from adultery. Notice with me in verse 30. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold and he shall give all the substance of his house. Now, remember what we said before. That God hates all sin without a doubt. But not all sin has the same consequences. Any of us could be very sympathetic to someone who's starving, who's homeless, who hasn't eaten in a while, and they shoplift, take from the store just to be, have something to eat. Every single one of us could be sympathetic to that fight. Every one of us could be sympathetic to someone who's struggling and they ended up stealing some money when no, someone's not looking from the wallet or find something and, and take it for themselves in order to feed themselves. Every one of us could be sympathetic here. The Bible says that if they get caught, you know, there's a little restitution that can be paid and then it could be forgotten about. You know, we're not going to bring it up ever again. But adultery is a sin that has horrible consequences. Notice if you don't mind. It says in verse number 32, But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. That he, that he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. Sin, adultery is a sin that ends up damaging the person doing the sin. It's a sin, they're lacking understanding, they are hurting themselves. They think that it's just a matter of pleasure. I could get a by with it, I just need comfort, I just need this. And that moment of pleasure is going to destroy the person engaged in this sin. Hold your finger here and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Now inside of the church of Corinth, they fancy themselves as super spiritual. And yet as they're super spiritual, they have lots of problems going on. These super spiritual Christians were allowing inside of their church membership a man who was currently having relations with his father's wife. It was horrible and it was not being dealt with. Everybody knew about it, but nobody was dealing with it. In this super spiritual church, they had so much pettying fighting that they were taking each other to court to a civilian court and, and hashing out their problems in the public for everyone to see. In this super spiritual uh, church, they had people who were actually teaching others, it's all right to go visit a harlot. It's fine. And they were teaching this is acceptable inside of a church. Ah, go ahead. It's no big deal. I mean, you know, you go ahead and do whatever you want. They gave all kinds of excuses inside of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, speaking about, uh, notice some of these things that they had here. Verse number 13. Uh, verse number 12. All things are lawful unto me. All things are lawful to me. They had slogans. People would say, listen, all things are lawful to me. I could go ahead and visit a prostitute. All things are lawful to me. See, I'm still going to heaven. I could do whatever I want. They had these little catchphrases. You know what we have today is the same catchphrase in a different form. Legalist! You're legalist! Legalist is something that non-spiritual Christians usually tell a pastor who tries to have standards. Listen, this is what we're going to do in the church and this is what we're not going to do in the church. Legalist! By the way, legalist is not in the Bible. It is a man-made term. But it is something that people use. It's a slogan. It's a catchphrase. All things are lawful unto me. I could do whatever I want. Notice another catchphrase, verse 13. Meats for the belly and belly for the meats. 
God made the meats for the belly and he made for the belly for the meats. Listen, God made all things so we should be able to enjoy all things. That's what they were saying. These are the catchphrases going around. Listen, I can go ahead and engage whatever I want. God made me to enjoy life so I can enjoy it. These are super spiritual Christians here. And this is what they were saying to justify all of this. Now Paul just flips his spiritual lid and he starts yelling. This is garbage. He's upset and he begins to scream. If you read this passage monotone, you're reading it wrong. He is upset. This is not good. This is not. He's just blowing his mind. Notice if you don't mind. Verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid! What? What? Know ye not that which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. He's just, what are you guys thinking? You can't justify this. What do you, no! Verse 17, but he that joined to the Lord is one spirit. Notice his conclusion statement to this. Flee fornication. Flee fornication. Those are two powerful words there. Flee fornication. That word flee means to run. Not engage, not flirt with it, not skirt about it, not see how close you can get to it. Flee! Run! Stay away from this! Isn't that what Proverbs was saying at the very beginning? Don't look at the strange woman! Beware of her lips! Beware of her looks! She's going to destroy you! Stay away! Run! That word flee does not mean stay and look, prance, get close, say I can handle it. Run! Run! But then notice the word fornication. The word fornication is a very interesting word. Remember that at the time of this writing, the Roman Empire is in charge. 75% of the world uh, is, of the Roman wor- uh, citizens, people in it, are slaves. So because of this, a lot of terminology from the slave market came into it. The word fornication is actually from the slave market terms. That one of the uh, most abundant slaves that would be auctioned off would be a harlot, a prostitute. And because she was used up and because of the things that she went through, she would be the cheapest slave that would be offered on the auction block. And this word fornication comes with that idea. It comes with the idea of someone that is bought cheaply from the auction block and is now entangled. Think about that. Not only is the harlot very obviously sold and entangled, so is the person who commits adultery. They've now been sold into sin and are now entangled of consequences and action that they'll never be able to get out of. Paul says, flee fornication. By the way, since I'm here, that word fornication is now translated or is the same root word where we get our word pornography. Flee fornication is also saying flee pornography. We live in a pornographic age. People have access to it everywhere and anywhere. It is more abundant than ever ever before it is available and people justify themselves well I'm just looking at the beauty of the lady flee fornication stay away from it they've attempted to do studies on what watching pornography does to the mind of a person but in order to do the study they cannot find enough people who have not watched pornography to do the study properly That is the type of age that we live in, that it is so abundant. I had a police officer who is not a Christian, not saved, doesn't go to church. Someone once asked him, how old shall a child be before we give him a cell phone? And he looked at them and said, whatever age you want them to start watching pornography. You could get a phone and you could get access to pornography immediately. 
Children should not have electronics. They should not have phones. Legalist. No, I'm trying to help you. I am trying to help you. I'm trying to protect you because this is destroying the moral fabric of our country. It is destroying churches and it's destroying lives. And so many people are stuck on this. Flee fornication. Flee pornography. Stay away from it. Stay away. We saw in the Old Testament a picture of someone who fled fornication. His name was Joseph. When Potiphar's wife tried to hit up on him, he tried to stay away from her. Finally, she cornered him and... He said, my master's, uh, the master of the house is gone. You can now do whatever you want. No one will know. He took off. She grabbed his coat and he took off, left the coat. He said, I'm gone. Of course, in the Old Testament, there was another man who should have fled, but he did not and brought so much ruin upon himself and his family and his country. And that was David. Flee fornication. Notice again, verse number 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. That's exactly what it said back in Proverbs chapter 6. Whosoever committeth adultery, in verse 32, with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. Adultery is a sin that will destroy its own person. When it says that adultery lacks understanding, it carries the idea that it's void of common sense. <laughs> All right. I know not to put my hand into a big grossing fire. Why? It's going to hurt me. I am not going to commit adultery. Why? It's going to hurt me. The person who's engaged in that has lost their common sense. They don't realize they are hurting themselves. They're lacking understanding. They're void of understanding at the moment. Notice again, verse number 33. A wound and dishonor shall he get. And his reproach shall not be wiped away. Adultery is a stupid crime because it's l driven by lust and passion just for a momentary desire with no attention given to the consequences. What consequences are there in adultery? There are three major type of consequences. There's a physical consequence. A physical consequence. Adultery is referred to the Bible in the Bible as a defilement. You defile the body. It is, God has designed us to be pure people. And he designed a marriage for one woman, one man, for one lifetime. But when we go outside of that, we defile our bodies. We physically soil our bodies. There's a physical consequence. There's a psychological consequence. Guilt does all types of untold damage to a personal person's moral and mental health. This guilt. That's why the Bible says here that a wound and dishonor shall he get and his reproach shall not be wiped away. People who've engaged in immorality inside of adultery, this is not something that you could just wipe away and say, okay, it's done and over with. It's not a type of thing. Well, I forgive you. You forgive me. Okay. It's all done. It's not that easy. It can't be wiped away. Now, hold on. There's hope. There's restoration. There is great hope. And we're going to talk about that hope in just a moment. But it's not just wiped away. And what happens is that if people say, well, I'm just going to wipe it away, redo, we're going to pretend it didn't exist. It doesn't fix that guilt that is destroying the person on the inside. It's going to affect their mental health. It's going to affect how they deal with things. It's going to affect their relationships. This bitterness that will form, this loathing of oneself, this guilt that they have is going to be such a burden that they're not going to be able to succeed in the relationships they're supposed to have. Not until they get that fixed. Now, let me tell you, there's hope. You are not done. It is not just wiped. Uh, it is not something that says, well, you know, you have no hope. There is hope, but it is not as easy as wiping it away. 
but God can restore. But we have to understand there's consequences. Someone who doesn't recognize the consequences when they've engaged in here will not get the full restoring that they need. Does that make sense? I'm trying to help you now. I'm trying to say that God can do a restoring, but we have to admit that there's consequences that happen and we have to treat the wound. The wound. If I, there's a big gash in front of me, I could put a Band-Aid on there and say it's all better, but if I need stitches and you could see the bone, that Band-Aid will not make it better. It's going to grow worse and worse and worse until it affects the whole body. It needs to be fixed. It needs to get properly treated, not just Band-Aid or duct taped. This is something that needs to be handled correctly. And by the way, the Bible says there's hope. That's what I'm trying to say. There is hope. We live in such a broken society. Without a doubt, I'm not speaking to angels. Not everyone who's listening to me is saying, listen, I'm the purest person of all. I understand that there was a life before salvation. There was things that occurred. But there's hope and restoring. But we have to recognize there's consequences that have to be dealt with and treated properly. So you can get proper healing. This is a message of hope. There is physical consequences. There are psychological consequences. This guilt will destroy. This bitterness will eat its own container. Then there's a spiritual consequence. It's a sin that could cause a person to be set aside from the work of God. If a pastor commits the sin of adultery... He is disqualified from being a pastor. He is set aside for service. This is a big deal because the calling of God is without repentance. For person, it could be a sin that could cause church discipline. That's what Paul was telling the church of Corinth. Why didn't you handle this? You knew this adultery was going on. This should have been something handled within the church. But you're so spiritual that you don't need it. He's upset. This is a sin that has consequences spiritually. Most importantly, it affects our relationship with the Lord, our fellowship with the Lord. This has long-lasting consequences that do not wipe away. Now, there's restoration. The Bible says, Galatians 6, 1, Ye that are spiritual, restore such a one. That if someone does fall into a sin, we need to do everything we can to help lift them up, to help clean them up, to help change them, not elbow drop them and take turns kicking them. We that are spiritual should be doing everything we can to help restore and heal them so they can thrive in the life that God's given to them. It is not over. There is help. And there's help available. God can help. Notice if you don't mind, it goes on, verse 34. We could see something else. For jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. Now it gives a flip side. A man whose wife stepped out on him, committed adultery, committed this sin. He does not take it well. There's something about how God has designed man is that this does not go well. And it is not something that you give him a gift and say, all right, well, is this better? It is not better. Let me tell you, that man needs healing and he needs help. It's not something that goes away. And it, if it's just try to be wiped away, then that family will not get restored. There's hope for the home, I'm saying that. But not without dealing with these consequences and taking care of them. That rage does not go away. There's no such thing as a do-over and then all of a sudden it's magically gone. You say, well, ladies aren't that away. I don't know. All I know is what it says here in men and knowing how men are, men do not take this well. Men do not <laughs> deal with it well. And God said that. They, you want to talk about ladies being emotional? You let a guy whose lady who committed adultery against him. He's an emotional and there's no reasoning. There's no logic. He may try to put on a good facade. He may try to say, well, listen, I'm good. He is not good. 
You know what? He needs some grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to help him through this, to understand the forgiveness that God gave to that man, that that man can have towards his wife, but it is not easy and it's not just wiped over. Now listen, there is hope. I'm going to tell you straight away, my first purpose of this message is preventative maintenance. Flee fornication. Don't get into this in the first place. Stay away. Teenagers, keep yourself pure. My wife made a promise at age 14 that she was going to save her first kiss for, when she, for her wedding day. Not for who she was going to marry, but her wedding day. And praise the Lord, she went to a wedding altar pure and had her very first kiss then. I know we live in a society where that sounds so fantastical, but you can make a pledge. Teenagers, if you've never made a promise like that, may I say consider making a promise like that? I'm going to save my first kiss for my wedding day. When the preacher now pronounces you man and wife, and you say, well, I'm not going to have practice. That's right, you get plenty of practice later. Let it be a horrible kiss, but let it be your first one. Save it. My first priority in this is preventative maintenance. If I could help someone, if I could keep someone, if I can take a married couple and have a guy to say, I'm going to stop watching pornography and I'm going to keep my mind on my wife that God gave me and I'm going to work on my marriage. Great, wonderful, preventative maintenance. If I could keep a marriage together by having some guy say, you know what? I know that girl as a flirt. I'm just not going to deal with her. Praise the Lord. If I could save a marriage. Wonderful. But I want to give hope because we live in a broken world. And I know that we have people who are going to be listening to this message for, for many years afterwards. There is hope. But it's going to take work and you can't wipe away the consequences. Those consequences must be dealt with. Bitterness and guilt. If they're not dealt with, they're going to be covered up. And that bitterness is going to grow and that bitterness is going to be towards the other spouse and they'll never have restitution. They'll never become one flesh again. There will be two people living in the same house and that's it. I told you at the very onset that of all the sins that are mentioned in the Bible, this is the one that makes us the most uncomfortable because it's very uncomfortable. But because the Bible mentions it so many times, I have to mention it. Because we have to give people preventative maintenance. Then we have to give them hope. Realistic hope. That these things need to be dealt with. Marriages can be solved. Marriages can be fixed. There can be restitution. But these consequences have to be dealt with. In order for them to be true reconciliation. We want to salvage homes. We want to take what we have and strengthen the homes up. If there's a family whose husband is stuck on pornography, let me tell you, pornography is such an addiction. Many people said that pornography is more addictive than crack or any other drugs. And yet, it's such an acceptable sin that everyone's doing it. Let me tell you, if there's pornography in the home, that marriage is not as sound as you think it is. You say, well, I could get away with it. No, no, no. You can't be play with fire and not be burned. I'm trying to say that there is help. And we'd be glad to help you. I'd be glad to set an appointment for anybody who wants to meet me later on in private. And says, what can we do? I'll be glad to help. We'd glad to go through the steps. I'm saying there's no magic wand. There's work, but there's hope. We live in a world that is clearly falling apart. A world that is clearly needing help. By the way, many of you are going to deal with co-workers who brag about adultery, brag about the things that are going on. One day they're going to need someone to help restore the mess that they have. We need to know something about this. You need to have a little bit of idea of the consequences they're going to be facing because it's not an idea of just, we'll just forgive him. 
There's no such thing as that in this case. There are things that need to be dealt with. Serious things. But there is hope. I'm so thankful we have a Savior who loves us so very much. A Savior who's interested in restoring, fixing, healing, and strengthening marriages. Strengthening homes. And we have to be honest that this is a sin that permeates our country and our society. We cannot get away with it. We can't turn a blind eye from it. We live in a time where teenagers are committing fornication and it is promoted. We live in a time where kindergartners are now ex- exposed to sexual things right off the bat. This is going to get worse, not better. And we have to do even more preventative maintenance. And we have to do more restoring. But there is hope. Because we have a God in heaven who loves us so much. And his forgiveness is so real. There is hope for the home. And we want to help. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.